coming out and talk to uh, folks here in New Mexico and uh, to see some old old friends' faces. So um, let's let's get started and talk a little bit about secure supply chain information management, what it is, what it's not, and then uh, essentially uh, why we're doing this. Uh, so, well, let's let's start with why are we doing this. Um, so not all supply chain risks are related to security, but all supply chain risks can be exacerbated by security. And this was uh, my co-presenter, Jason Thomas. And then of course, James Carville made the statement, it's the economy stupid back many, many years ago. One of the key challenges uh, with supply chain is when we start thinking about it, these are really economic attacks. Uh, they're economic attacks that are able to have an impact upon our businesses or upon our uh, processes or our organizations. And so the outcome that we have are problems that can uh, essentially resonate across uh, entire you know, swaths of organizations all at once. Um, when, when you start adding, sup, um, wow, that's not English. Uh, when you start adding cybersecurity into the mix, uh, you can also have huge economic impacts across entire fleets of companies, you know, companies that may be completely unrelated except through their singular use of a similar product or service. So who are we? Well, my partner, Jason Thomas, uh, who's who may or may not be able to join us this evening as uh, senior director of IT security at Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. And Jason and I worked together uh, at Exelon uh, many years ago. Um, Jason was my risk manager, uh, amongst other things, and uh, I'm I am Spencer Wilcox. I'm the executive director of technology and the chief security officer at PNM Resources here in Albuquerque. Uh, prior to that, I was director of uh, OT cybersecurity, and then prior to that, director of cyber risk uh, intelligence and resilience uh, for uh, Exelon. So. Why are we talking about this? Well, everybody's heard about availability issues in the supply chain. So I'm sure nobody's had any issues with you know, finding toilet paper or anything else uh, in this market. But you know, the reality is that over the last several years, we've seen a, a heightening of tensions and a heightening of issues on the geopolitical front uh, that have resulted in delays and problems in the supply chain. You may recall that there was a, a boat that got stuck in the in the Suez Canal a while back, and that created you know huge supply chain issues. Right now, due to COVID, you're hearing about uh, ships that are stuck off the port of uh, uh, off the port of Long Beach, uh, primarily in California, uh, that's resulting in huge snarls and and traffic problems uh, with getting things in places that need to, that need them. But when you start thinking about the interconnectedness of supply chains, what you start to realize is that something as simple as a bullfrog spa can help to help you to understand it. And bullfrog spas is was there was an article in the Wall Street Journal. I encourage you guys to to take a look at the the PDF or or the uh, P, the PowerPoint, and you'll be able to go to this link. Um, they explained it really well using a hot tub. And they were talking about the various chemicals that are used in pouring the, the hot tub, the parts for the motors, the parts for the pumps, the parts for the, the pipes, you know, the parts for the outer shells, and how each part might go two or three times across the country or from overseas before it's able to get there. And as a result, you end up in this strange situation where you had certain key suppliers who, who were... <clears throat> by virtue of being unavailable, uh, causing multiple suppliers uh, to be unable to fulfill their deliveries to Bullfrog. And it's really kind of an interesting story because availability really is the key here. So one small, delicate uh, problem within the supply chain can resonate and reverberate across multiple uh, different companies. And that's how solar winds worked, right? So with the solar winds event, you know, we all you know had the opportunity to either experience it or to uh, certainly read about it and have to go search for IOCs. But the truth was that our adversaries figured out that they could go to one vendor that had a whole bunch of people in common 
compromise a single credential and as a result of it, get into thousands of potential uh, victims. They were able to compromise everyone from Microsoft and through the government, according to the papers, you know, and ultimately all, almost all of the Fortune 1000. Uh, Kaseya was another event. And Kaseya in this case was a supplier whose, whose role was to provide cybersecurity services uh, as a middle uh, or a back office customer or two back office customers. And in some of those cases, uh, they were able, because of one compromise, to get into 1,500 business, uh, 1,500 businesses, I'm sorry, and spread ransomware, right? Um, at the Port of Houston, not too long ago, uh, there was a state-sponsored hacking group that targeted the port uh, using a Zoho Zero Day. Now, why did this one matter? Well, because they had to shut down the port for several days while they were trying to figure out what exactly happened. And we all know... Uh, if we've ever had to go through a government uh, incident response that, you know, once the cert showed up, uh, you can rest assured that they were shut down for several more days while the Coast Guard looked into things. And then, of course, there's the biggest disruption that we've experienced yet, which is COVID-19, right? So a pandemic resulted in, you know, many, many delays and many, many supply chain issues that just continue to reverberate out. Think of it like shock waves or like throwing a, a pebble into a pond. It continues to spread uh, and the issues continue to spread as a result. So we started talking about what are the issues with supply chain. And at the end of the day, we realized that, you know what, the issues always will be confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Uh, even though ISC Squared has recently added two more items into the CIA triad, <clears throat> don't, let's not get started on that. Um, really, these three issues, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, remain the key concerns that we have when we start talking about supply chain, in particular from a cybersecurity lens. But from any risk lens, these apply. So, what are some of those things that we would worry about? What about confidential information or account theft or trade secrets or data theft from a confidentiality perspective? But also, when you start thinking about supply chain, what about the confidentiality of a key formula or key, um, key design specifications? And that confidentiality, when it's lost, can result in the attacker gaining information about you, right? And about their secondary uh, effect target. Um, in many cases, what we talk about, like in my industry, is that I am a I am a primary target for secondary effect. So nobody cares about going and compromising a utility unless it's for the purpose of either A, and hey, there's Jason Thomas there, um, either A, making the decision that they're going to break in so that they can steal customer information, right? or they're gonna break in to do something bad to the electric grid, right? So, um, hey, Jason, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Sure. Hi, folks, uh, this is Jason Thomas. I'm a co-presenter with Spencer. Um, literally last minute, last minute Larry coming in at the, uh, at the nth hour um, to, to join the, uh, the conversation. But uh, thanks for letting me sort of glom on at the, literally at the last second. Yep, and again, very sorry about this and uh, Jason, but you know, I know that uh, the consummate professional at ER will make this uh, best presentation of all times. So let's go back to that one. So from an integrity perspective, then think about what are the kinds of things that might happen, right? Um, you might have back doors put in or product tampering or subversion of the, of the products themselves, products or services. It could be an alteration of the product or source code modifications. Could even be that kid that, you know, your junior developer decided to hire off of Fiverr because he couldn't figure out the code and he wanted to go out drinking for the evening, right? So, you know, at the end of the day, who are the people that are making modifications to the products and services that you sell or that you buy? And we don't know the answer to that is the biggest problem, right? So we start thinking about those issues and then we realize that the biggest issue in the supply chain is availability. It's are the goods and services that we depend upon going to be available to us when we need them? So think about shipping, as we've already talked about, or a denial of service. So if I can shut down the Port of Houston, 
Then the, the things that you're dependent on to uh, make a good Christmas for your kids uh, may or may not show up, right? How about a process delay? Just a simple process delay. Like, what if, um, what if what I really want to do is just make sure that it takes a little bit longer uh, for a, a ham to be processed by my adversary, right? I know that sounds weird to say a ham, right? But when you think about it, one of the uh, a U.S. based company, Smithfield uh, Pork Products, was procured by a Chinese firm not too awfully long ago. Uh, Smithfield Pork, very, uh, very traditional. You know, they they sell you ribs and hams and whatever else. Um, owned by the Chinese government now. Hey, there's Henry Bell. So the the end state of this is maybe, just maybe, um, sorry, I'm getting a little background noise there. Um, so maybe, just maybe, you could have, say, a ham that's been processed by a, a, a third party who's, who then gets breached, I'm sorry, who's being processed by somebody other than Smithfield, it gets breached by China for the purpose of slowing down their supply chain or causing them not to be able to deliver making preferential treatment for uh, their products. So, so I don't know if we can uh, maybe, there we go. All right. So ultimately those lead to disruptions and those are concerns that all of us have. So we started talking about all of these things, all of these issues and all of these uh, potential threats that we could imagine in our threat model. And what we realized was it was just too complex. You know, there were too many possible things that could go wrong. So how do you start characterizing this in order to really start talking about securing it? You know, um, and I'll use the example of uh, Matthew, who's on the call. Uh, Matthew is a, He's an incident response person. He does a lot of uh, a lot of different work for a lot of different companies. And if he's breached, then you know the information that he holds about other companies uh, could potentially be breached as well. But he has suppliers too, and they have suppliers, and they have suppliers, right? And so it, it ends up being turtles all the way down. How do we deal with that? Well, we thought about it. We talked a little bit about well, what are the steps in any given supply process? that we can articulate, and then how do they interrelate with one another? So we decided first off that it was a process. It's not linear like the OSI model. Um, it starts with design. So we design a, we design a product, a good, a service, whatever it is. Um, the work that goes into that can be, be subverted at many different layers, but that's the first step. We then manufacture. Right. So whatever it is that we designed now needs to be made. Uh, we make the sausage uh, to go back to the Smithfield example. And then ultimately, uh, there may be other manufacturers that we are also dependent upon uh, for some of that. Those would be procured by us. Right. And then those things that we procure are transferred uh, through a shipping process, typically, uh, or via the Internet in some cases. Right. Um, and then they have to be implemented. Once they're implemented, they have to be integrated, integrated into the, into the various processes that you and your business have. And finally, the ultimate uh, the, or the, the ultimate pinnacle of this process is they have to be managed and administered. Now, as we start thinking about that, imagine that this, this circle that we're seeing here, imagine that it's repeated dozens of times within each given circle. So you may have hundreds or thousands of different uh, people and or organizations involved in any given supply chain process. Jason, any thoughts that you'd like to add on that? Got to find the unmute button. I think it's important to, to, to add to that last point is that you can almost think of it as cycles on cycles, which is there, there are lots of cycles within each, within each part, within each sort of uh, layer, but at the same time, each of the layers themselves are, are sort of have their own have their own sort of interface with one another. So there's uh, the kind of the kind of expand on the the, the sort of the scope of the the, the challenge is there's it, it kind of gets really quickly and 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 it's and, but again 
there's there's the interrelation. You know, unlike the OSI model, um, this one's a little bit different because you have to really think about it as a, as a, as a it's, it's truly a cycle where everything can interplay with one another as opposed to it it being state. You know, sort of a linear transition, if you will. So when we start thinking about the process level threats, right? So we we talked about design and manufacture and procure and transfer and implement and integrate and manage and administer. But realistically, there are really only, let's say, five threat types that apply here. And those are disruption, right? The first one that we would see is something that disrupts any one of these processes can have an impact upon the entire supply chain. Um, a delay, again, it's, it's primarily availability uh, style attack, but any delay could cause a process to fail. Right. So when we think about availability, it might be an availability attack or if it's on the cyber side, it could be a delay that results in a timing attack. Right. Um, or like we just tested at GridX, imagine for a moment that I block GPS. Right. And so or I subvert GPS and the outcome of that might be a delay in time, which causes my communications to fail because they're expecting timing uh, to, to be you know, accurate to within, you know, milliseconds. Um, subversion, I could cause something to operate not as expected, right? Um, destruction, like what we saw today. Actually, you know, interesting little uh, tidbit. I don't know if you guys have been pay paying attention to the the Bloom Bloomberg, actually. Bloomberg announced today that there have been a number of, or there's been a huge uptick in the number of Chinese ransomware attacks. But they're unlike traditional ransomware, um, there's no there's no demand for payment at the end. So that's just a pure destructive attack. We're encrypting your stuff to destroy it, right? So, uh, and then there's surveillance, of course. So what can I know about you? What can I do uh, to gather intelligence about my adversary uh, or my target? So. Um, those yield, uh, again, impacts to confidentiality, availability, and integrity. So how do we think about this model? So let's think about it like cycles within cycles, right? Um, we start with design and we put in some controls, right, to limit our exposure to those disrupt, delay, subvert, destroy, and surveil. Uh, tactics, right? And then as as the product moves from design to manufacture, we need to put in controls to do this. But who does each of these steps? Is it you? Is it your company? Or are there numerous companies that you're dependent on there? And then how do you think about those controls that exist, sorry, um, those controls that exist for the end, uh, uh, for that company that you're working with? do you have a way to kind of assess the quality of those controls? And many of us do procurement uh, language. Many of us do uh, surveys and questionnaires that we send out to our suppliers. But how many of you send those same surveys or questionnaires to their suppliers and to their suppliers and to their suppliers? Or are you dependent upon the company that you do business with to do the same thing? And are they dependent upon the same treatment all the way down, right? So as you think about this, think about the controls at each one of these layers as being something that helps you to uh, get a handle on it. But ultimately, you're going to be dependent upon the veracity of somebody else uh, to give you good information or intelligence about your, your ultimate exposure. So how would this work? What are some common threat types that we might experience? We'll use availability as an example, and we could go on with this for the rest of our natural lives, literally, and never get to the end of it. So we're going to jump in on just a few common threats. Jason, did you want to talk about some of those common threats? Sure. Um, so obviously, under common threats that are obviously going to affect the availability, we have force majeure. You know, basically, the ability of a nation state to do some legal some action that is enabled it, it's, it can do, you know, enable a law or something along those lines where it could have an impact on the availability of um, of the supply chain. Obviously, conflict or warfare is another aspect that you have to account for. Um, obviously, it, it, it's while it happens infrequently, there is still the, the potential for uh, conflict between states uh, being kinetic or otherwise. Uh, economic, uh, obviously, there is the the challenge of um, 
the, the interconnectedness of the global economy and the impact thereof of, of fluctuations, but also specific actions a state may take that are economic in nature. Um, inflation. Um, hey, uh, anybody read the paper this week? Um, obviously, inflation has another impact, is another impact there um, on supply chain. Also, regulation. Uh, the, the, you know, as, as, as countries and as other entities impose regulation on, on various parts of various sectors, those have impacts on uh, those clearly have some impacts. Uh, finally, insurability. Um, as we've experienced and or seen, you know, the challenge of insurability is, you know, with, is does it exist in the space or does it not? What's the cost of that insurance? Um, you know, is it something that there that 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 you can that you can get or can you get the desired coverage? You know, those are those are sort of what we've defined as the common threats to availability uh, in this in that process level. Absolutely. So let's let's talk a little bit about that insurability, and we'll jump right over to uh, transference, okay? Uh, which you can see on the right hand side of the slide. So during transference, imagine that we're shipping a product from China to the United States. Now this is something that's been done since literally the the 1200s, you know, um, maybe even before. You would insure that product either through a guild back in the old days, or you know, through the uh, through the you know royal whatever, you know, somebody's uh, office. Uh, the Knights Templar were an insurance agency at the end of the day, right? So what what is it that you're doing there? Well, you're you're insuring against piracy. You're insuring against the loss of the cargo. You're insuring against the loss of you know. The, the thousand horses and two tons of grain that you're shipping over to the to the Holy Land for your uh, for your uh, crusade. But in today's day and age, we do the same thing. It's, it's not really changed. Um, the mechanisms to do this, you know, it's against piracy and it's against terror and it's against sabotage and it's against malfunction and it's against, you know, storms and, you know, other losses. But during shipping, let's think about the opportunities that might exist. So if I'm a nation state adversary, can I board that ship and make a modification to the product uh, that's that's in transit? Sure, in theory, right? Um, if I know where the box is, can I get into it? Can I make a change to whatever's inside that box or shipping container? Can I uh, guarantee that it's not going to change in transit when it's going across the internet, you know? Um, how do we how do we protect against that? Well, we look at the MD5 hash or the SHA-1 value or the SHA-256 value, right, of the of the product that's going uh, to us from the supplier who's going to send us our license keys, you know, electronically. Can somebody make a change to that in transit? Those things, those issues during transference, um, are the most commonly protected against. You know, because that's the that's an obvious state transition where everybody goes, oh, hey, look, it's really weak right here. You know, it's out of everyone's control uh, during that time of transference. So insurance comes along to take care of that. Um, protections come along to take care of that. Right. The same is true, though, at the implementation level. Do you ever take out insurance or, or require a vendor to have insurance that's going to do the work to install the product for you? Absolutely, right? Do you do your due diligence on those companies? Do you make sure that they have the availability of their staff before you get started on product or process with them, right? So these are the kinds of things that we have to really think about uh, as we're moving through when we just think about something as simple as availability. But we can also, we could apply the words integrity here. Uh, we can we can apply the word uh, confidentiality here, and we would see the same kinds of potential threats to disruption, delay, subversion, destruction, and surveillance. So we decided to fingerprint that. We said, how could something like that work? And we talked a little bit about a ship stuck in the Suez Canal. Jason, do you want to talk about the Ever Given? Uh, yes, the ship that launched a thousand memes. Um, or a million, depending upon your counts. Uh, so if you recall from earlier in the year in March, uh, there was a ship that ran aground in the Suez, one of the massive large container ships that effectively gummed up the, the shipping canal for about, uh, I believe, not quite two weeks, uh, a little less than 14 days. But that had uh, implications for the routing of, that, of, of, of trade, basically where shipping companies were already looking to, to circumnavigate the Horn of Africa 
to 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 deal with the, the blockage of the Suez Canal, um, which was which is clearly a, a, a rather a rather significant shipping route in that part of the world. Um, so after it took a lot of time for uh, the Egyptian authorities to clear the Ever Given to at least allow the flow before they actually released the ship itself um, from its uh, from sort of its its its, its state where it was sort of it, it had kept of it. We clearly had um, in our model here impacts to you know the, to the confidentiality and confidentiality integrity and availability in each of the phases of our supply chain. So Spence, if you want to start, Absolutely. I can chime, I can chime in as well. Yeah, so so let's think about it. Of course, it disrupted availability uh, in transference, implementation, integration. Right? It clearly delayed availability. At, you know, for manufacturers who are waiting on products for procurement, um, for transfer, for implementation, for integration, for manage and administer. But it also gave an opportunity to really subvert manufacture. So think about that. If if what I was really trying to do was to stop somebody from being able to make the product that was you know, dependent upon something on that ship, I could have subverted it, uh, or I did successfully subvert it uh, by crashing that boat uh, sideways in the Suez Canal, uh, you know, or whatever, right? Um, but surveillance was also an opportunity. So this gave you an opportunity to identify what, who was, who was impacted as a result of it, right? So if I really want to know what your processes are dependent upon, do something like this, right? It's a great way to, to screw everything up for everybody and then to figure out who's screaming as a result of it, right? And, and to some extent, um, and to some, I'm sorry, Spence, and to some extent, no, go ahead. It affords, it affords an interesting actor the opportunity to find out what actually is in transit, um, you know, to actually to kind of get a, to get a look. I mean, Obviously, there are certain controls on containers, but to some extent, there's an there's an opportunity to, to see what's in transit, and then obviously there's the you know the, the just in just from the pure perspective of um, of what's been manufactured, but also in the transfer perspective of you know where, where's what's what's going from point A to point B, if you will, um, that an actor can find out as a result of this delay. That's that's right. So think about those uh, those uh, government folks, whether they were British or Egyptian or you know, pick your pick your uh, nationality that probably went through and inspected the various cargo on that ship during that event. Um, another one was the super micro hack. Now I'll, I'll freely admit, nobody knows whether this really happened. You know, we all read it and then we all went, well, everybody says, no, no, it probably didn't really happen. But so, um, so anyway, I think I, I really, uh, but for whatever it's worth, when you start thinking about Supermicro, this is the, the allegedly uh, some chipsets that were changed, and Amazon had them installed in EC2, right? So you know your Elastic Cloud was completely dependent upon uh, compromised chipsets, um, allegedly. And so when we think about that, subversion and integrity were really the the primary issue here. Now there was also a surveillance issue, right? So from a confidentiality perspective, you could know everything there was to know that was passing across that chipset if you were the controller of the chipset. So uh, always a risk. And then finally, uh, let's use this this one. Now I know some of you guys work in the government, and um, so I'm I'm sure none of you have heard this term Huawei. Right, um, but for whatever it's worth, if you've uh, if you've used a telephone in the last twenty years, you've probably used a Huawei product, whether you knew it or not. So, Jason, did you want to talk a little bit about uh, what was interesting about Huawei? Yeah, so so obviously, uh, as part of the as part of the prior administration, Huawei was banned from their basis of the implementation of their network technology in the U.S. market, and that had implications for. Um, other other sort of other nation states in making a similar kind of decision with with Huawei's the usage of Huawei technology within their space. Um, obviously, the biggest impact here was um, around the the confidentiality and, and the and the disruption um, in in that in that area for the for the for 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 where this was in the implementation and integration and the administration area. Right, basically, um, <laughs> the ban meant rip it out, rip that equipment out, and or if you have if you have equipment that's that's planned to be installed, oh yeah, that can't happen. So go find a replacement right now. Um, so the disruption was rather significant. Uh, obviously from an availability perspective, all of a sudden you've ripped out a bunch of, of of network gear that you had planned that would have had a fairly decent shelf life that you now have to rip and rip not 
not even rip and replace, but you basically just have to go find something else because you can't install this. Absolutely. So, you know, and I, I think we might have missed the boat on this one with delay because, you know what, quite frankly, I think everything was delayed yep. as a result of it. Yep. Um, you know, talking with our, uh, with just our telecoms companies uh, here in the region, uh, they all had, you know, they, they all had plans at least, you know, four or five years ago of using Huawei products and um, those are no longer available to them. Uh, clearly, subversion, destruction, and surveillance were also there. And then, of course, there's solar winds and Kaseya. And, and so that, that real risk associated with both of those, which we've already talked about, uh, were delays, uh, in many cases, destruction of data from an availability perspective, if you're a ransomware victim, uh, but surveillance and surveillance everywhere, right? So all along every one of their customers' supply chains. So how do you figure this out? How do you deal with something like supply chain? Well, it all starts with figuring out what your risk is, right? And how how better to do that than by knowing yourself, right? So when, when we start talking about um, how to kind of manage supply chain and supply chain risk, what we really start talking about are key risk indicators and key performance indicators. And those are leading indicators and lagging indicators, you know, just different words for the same thing. A risk indicator is something that's talking about the future state, right? It's talking about, it's predictive. It's it's a measurement of behaviors or actions in order to make a prediction of the future. Um, a KPI, on the other hand, is how well do we do something? You know, um, how well do we, uh, just for example, uh, manage our vulnerabilities, right? So, which might be a good KPI. Our KRI might be how many of those vulnerabilities are exploitable uh, to an outside uh, or by an outside party, you know, kind of like what uh, the CISA put out last week. So, you know, that we're all trying to figure out exactly what our exposure is to. We'll just leave that alone right now. So, so KRIs, again, leading indicators. So geopolitical climate. Do we have a heightening of tensions in China? Jason, do we have a heightening of tensions in China with China right now? Uh, if I if I could do my very best, Karnak, I would probably say all indications are yes. I'm with you. And so, you know, what's the country risk, right? So, are you doing business with a country that may not be super friendly to us tomorrow, or that might be taken over, like say the Ukraine, right? Um, not that that would ever happen. Or, or um, Afghanistan. Or Afghanistan, perhaps, right? Uh, terror risk. You know, is there is there a heightened sense of terror in the in the area, like what uh, DHS put out just the other day, in notifying us to all, you know, be alert for uh, sectarian violence here in the United States uh, as a result of the end of the Afghan um, the conflict? I guess is that the way they put it. Um, political instability. Um, I don't know about you, but you know, this country's a little, uh, maybe, just saying, right there in January, right? So civil unrest, you know, and we saw that uh, definitely in the last few years. Um, polarization of the populace, not that that ever happens uh, in Western society. And then economic instability, markets, interest rates, as we talked about, uh, consumer sentiment. You know, when you think about how do people feel about your brand, you know, and I see a couple of names on here that I, that I don't know. Brian, uh, Bethel me. Brian, who, who do you work with, if you don't mind my asking? I think Brian might not necessarily have heard. So that's okay. How about Ron Tafoya? Ron, who are you with? Okay, Jason, we put them all to sleep. It's it's uh it's we've either put them all to sleep or they're scared. Okay, no, no, I was on mute. So uh, I'm now working for AT and T as a all security right. uh, senior security product developer on the um, MSSP side. All right, and so I had the opportunity. I, I have the opportunity on a regular basis to work with Ron's wife. And uh, and have had the opportunity to interview Ron, who is a fantastic human being, and I, I strongly recommend him to anybody who's interested uh, 
in bringing somebody with great uh, security risk skills on board. But Ron, over at AT AT&T, how do people feel about your products? Well, I just saw a number today that was really impressive uh, for the state of Texas on the MMS, MSSP side, the customer satisfaction rate is at 99.61. That's amazing. That is a fantastic yep. number. So you've got pretty good consumer sentiment. Now, let's imagine that your PNM resources, the, the uh, electric power provider in the state or in central New Mexico, and uh, you're going through a merger. What do you think that looks like? Well, I know what that looks like. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, right? So not everybody is super thrilled with my company at the moment, even though I don't. I think we're doing a pretty bang up job. Uh, actually, it's, you know, I might be a little bit biased. But the reality is, if I've got somebody who's irritable with me, they might just decide to take advantage of that in order to uh, cause negative things to happen to my brand or to my company. Um, the climate itself could be an issue. And when I say climate, in this case, it could be climate change, but it could also be just climate of, of uh, you know, your personal opinions and, you know, again, this consumer sentiment concept, right? Um, environmental factors are another one, you know, especially right now. Um, are you Are you somebody that's a major polluter? Are you somebody who's, you know, got a product that, you know, I don't know, does, does something that, uh, that certain environmentalists don't necessarily like. What about social activism? And social activism could be everything from, you know, Black Lives Matter all the way over to, you know, the Hitler youth are marching, right? So, so please don't misinterpret what I'm saying as being, you know, uh, polarized in one way or the other. But if you are, if you become the target of a social activism group, you're not going to be able to get past that. They will not compromise, right? So all of those factors can be measured at least categorically. From a KPI perspective though, you might look at ransomware infection. How many times have you been infected with ransomware? Mm -hmm. Once, none, you know? Um, What's your economic forecasting look like? You know, what are your cost models and your budgets? Are you able to keep up with the costs of security uh, given the threat environment that you're in? Uh, And then what's your complexity? You know, so when you think about complexity, um, Bruce Schneier famously said, complexity is the enemy of security, right? And when he said that, what he's really trying to tell us was, hey, the more stuff you got, the harder it is to protect, you know, reduce your attack surface. But when you start thinking about the complexity of your systems and and their interdependence upon one another, each one of those failure modes, each piece in that attack surface has the potential to disrupt the rest of it. So can you measure that? Okay, so key risk indicators. Jason, did you wanna talk a little bit about uh, the the risk uh, equation and how that works? Sure. Um, so uh, obviously, I, I would like to think that most of us here are familiar with our, our, our familiar risk formula of, you know, risk is uh, the, the product of threat and vulnerability, but also times the impact. So obviously, the threats are the things that we that might cause something to occur. The vulnerability is is what would what would can be exploited by by that by a threat for something to occur. Uh, and the impact could be the consequences or damages, right? It could be monetary value. It could be some other figure. But basically. You know, best case to worst case, right? It's 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 what's the impact of of the of basically the 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 uh, the, the threatened vulnerability being in, being acted upon, um, and then ultimately that gives us a, a a calculation for risk. But obviously, you know, we've got to figure out. What, okay, great, we've defined risk. Here's a formula. You know, let me do a little quick bit of math, but we need to identify our events. So, what are the things that you want to happen? But better, what don't you want to have happen? Um, and obviously. This is where a, a bow tie model really comes to help to, 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 to help complete the picture of what you want to, of your threats and your impacts and your risk event and what basically what you want to have happen and what you don't want to have happen. Absolutely. So the bow tie model <clears throat> has been around for a number of years, and you know it's uh, there are really a couple of different ways to do a model like this. It's it's any causal analysis uh, tool will work. I happen to like this one. Jason and I used to use it at our previous employer. 
And it's something that it's easy to explain. It's easy to articulate. It's really easy for your board of directors to understand. Really, really easy. They get it. Okay. So you just talk about threats. What are my threats? Right. And then from my threats, I can talk about what are my controls. You know, those are the things that reduce the probability of an occurrence, right? So when I start thinking about threats, threats times vulnerability taken together equals a probability of an event occurring. So if I can do things that reduce that risk probability uh, by managing those vulnerabilities, understanding my own organization well, putting in preventive mitigations, um, then I can reduce the likelihood of this number three red scenario from occurring. And that that I'm not going to call it an incident. I'm going to call it an event, right? Because an event in this case is anything. It could be anything, right? But it's just the actualization of a threat. Um, then I need to contain those events, okay? And once I've contained the event itself, uh, then I get to measure the consequences. What were the consequences of that event occurring? So an example of this might be, uh, let's imagine that APT 37 um, in a row, uh, makes the, uh, or attempts to install uh, fake ransomware that's actually just destructive uh, malware into my environment. I have a preventive control uh, in place that, that catches it before it's able to actually trigger, and therefore I'm able to contain the infection before I have any consequence whatsoever, meaning that number four, there's no consequence. Right. That's awesome, right? But there is kind of a consequence because I have to spend the time dealing with it. I've got to, I've got to get it out of my environment. I've got to figure out how it got there to begin with. I've got to close it all off. I've got to make things right uh, so that it doesn't happen again. Ultimately, this causal model is something that you can begin uh, to start communicating effectively. And then, so we, we start talking about how do you then measure uh, each of those things? Well, the risk event uh, I can identify events that will either positively or negatively impact my business, right? I, for example, a subversion of a common supplier, solar winds, right? Um, I identify the threats that may cause the event to occur. Okay, now these threats aren't APT 37; they are malware, right? Or their <clears throat> their disruption of supply chain, right? Um, and then, so I may have poor patching control could be a threat to me, right? Or outdated software could be a threat to me. Excessive permissions could be a threat in this case. Um, then I identify the impacts. So what could happen to the company? So what could happen to your company or to your business or to your organization, right? And so Jason and I are in totally different types of organizations. Jason, give me an example of something that can have an, a, an impact upon the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. Sure. Um... In our case, uh, it would be if I'll, I'll look at it. I'll look at sort of an, an event that would have an impact. Would be we're we, we're concerned always about data and, and the data we we hold for our community, and we entrust all we we entrust a lot of that with third party providers. So we would be concerned around any type of loss or exfiltration or or theft or breach of that data, and that's where we would be concerned around. Um, you know, threats that could be the patching, could be software, could be permissions, could be um, a number of things that we are concerned about with those, with both those parties, but also to some, to also ourselves, because we do, we do hold some of, ultimately there's, there's something that we hold to our community. There's also a, a subset or a second set of that data we hold that we, we effectively dole out for research purposes. So. So imagine for a minute, and, and I, I would imagine that Jason, much like, like I do, uh, categorizes these things in a couple of different ways. You know, it's going to be an impact to my reputation, yeah. to my finances, or to my operations, right? And for, for me, at least, you know, an impact to my operations means that the lights are out and the beer gets hot. And nobody likes hot beer um, except the English. And we'll leave that alone for a minute. But, you know, yeah, no, it, it's not hot. Cask, it's like fifty-seven nothing, there's degrees. There's nothing it's wrong with Cascale. Nothing wrong. I know. I I enjoy I enjoy a good Cascale. So, but that said, um, you know, so when you think about it, you know, my job is to keep the lights on and the beer cold. 
those are the things that I care about. And I care about whether people hate my guts and, you know, whether they, whether they quit investing in my company and I care whether or not I'm going to have to pay millions of dollars in court fees or fines. Right. So ultimately we've got to think about those things. So what are the key risk indicators that I can use to kind of understand the likelihood that somebody is going to get into my environment, that one of these events is going to be caused. And this is where I make an assessment. I, and I can do this using high, medium, low. I can do it in a one to five. I can do it in whatever categorical approach I want, basically to say, is it bad or is it good? You know, or vice versa, you know, pick your, pick your direction. Um, so just remember, couple of basic things that you need to think about from a risk management perspective. Your cost of security might be a great uh, key risk indicator. So my cost of security increases with complexity and volume of my, of my portfolio or my compliance requirements, or a, if I have a low risk appetite, I'm not willing to accept a certain level of risk, right? Um, maybe the length of maintenance deferral, right? And the number and complexity of controls, themselves. So if I've got those, what can I do with that? Well, cost has increased. So that implies that I can, uh, I can measure my costs, right? And it also means that I can measure the cost of those controls in such a way, or those, those components right here, uh, in such a way that I can begin to measure the inverse of it, the complexity, right? And I can now tell my management, for instance, by the way, if I reduce the total number of assets that I have within the environment, then not only do we save money, we reduce security risk. Right? Hey, management likes to save money. Here's an opportunity. So let's talk about some other ways to manage security costs. And Jason, do you have any thoughts on, you know, some specifics that we can do? Um. Well, I, sort of funny. I mean, it, it, you're, you're, the notion of reducing the attack surface is huge, right? If, if you don't, and, and there's lots of different ways that you can do that, right? I think we tend to think of it in, in a pure asset perspective of how many servers, how many devices, how many things do I have out there? But there's also, um, I'll, I'll use it much more sort of softer is, is data, right? How much, you know, that's the, again, to call back the Schneier, you know, data is a toxic asset. So how much data do you have? And what's the actual, and of the data that you have, what's the stuff that you really need to have to conduct your business versus what's the stuff that you're carrying along because somebody somewhere thought these fields were a good thing to have. And they, that, introduced, that as a result, introduce risk into your environment. So perhaps it's, a, it's looking at reducing the data you collect or, 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 how, or how long that data lives. There's, there's, there's efforts that you can do there. Um, obviously, um, the byproduct of those is the ability to reduce the, 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 the scope of any compliance obligations you might have as a result. Um, also, reducing the attack surface is great if you're able to standardize those assets. Uh, another, obviously, way to, to sort of manage those costs, uh, and we'll kind of touch on this one, would be um, you know, going from managing your own stuff, right? The, the, I can, the only way I can know I can secure these things is if I do it myself or well, is, is looking to the cloud, right? moving things to the cloud for SaaS or, or what have you and, and, and sort of changing, right? You're, you're dealing with a cost perspective, but you're also to some extent, and we'll touch on this a little later, you're kind of doing a little bit of risk transference, if you will. Absolutely. And risk transference is a great way to, to manage uh, risk or at least to, to shunt some of it off to somebody else so that uh, two people have to bear the burden, right? Um, so what are some other things you can do? Well, there's risk transference that we talked about a little bit, um, but you can also avoid risk, right? So you can put in general controls, you can put in cyber frameworks, you know, the NIST cybersecurity framework for protecting critical infrastructure happens to be my particular favorite because it's easy to use. And I can put 127 controls in place and say, here, meet these requirements. Um, not terribly difficult to, to achieve that way. Um, doesn't work for everything, but it works for, for certain things. Um, supplier questionnaires. It's a great way to avoid some risk. You know, if they answer all the questions, no, I have no security, then you might not want to do business with me, right? Um, do your due diligence. You know, if you find out that the company is owned by uh, by your arch nemesis, maybe that's not who you do business with, right? Um, and then contract language. 
uh, there's there's several model contract languages uh, that are out there, but CMMC is a pretty common one uh, nowadays uh, for those people in government space. Uh, the EEI model contract language uh, for electricity providers is another good one. Uh, the, there's an EPRI study on the same thing. North American Transmission Forum has put out model contract language as well. Uh, and then there's the recent uh, edition of the Software Bill of Materials. And if you've never talked to Alan Friedman, He's doing a thing like the 15th through the 19th of December to talk about S-bombs uh, with CISA. So really good uh, presentation there if you get a chance. Uh, you can also do economic controls um, like risk transference, which is typically code for insurance, but it can also be uh, that you're sharing the risk with a, with a vendor. And then um, risk acceptance. Ultimately, what's your allowable loss? How much you're, are you willing to lose? Um, we can go into a lot of these. I'm, I'm going to, for sake of time, because we're, we're right at the four minute mark, uh, we're going to skip past a little bit of this. But one thing I want you to remember, the house always wins in risk transference. Um, what's your exit strategy? If you're transferring risk, when do you stop transferring risk? And when do you want to get out of it? And then do you hedge your bets or do you put a peanut butter spread out? So, uh, and then finally, are all your eggs in one basket with your insurance? Do you have a stack? All right, now, how do you measure this? Look, frankly, there are a million different ways that you can measure anything, right? Yep, exactly. Uh, Kentucky windage is my personal favorite. Um, but yeah, categorizing, you categorize the risk in each process step. You create the categorical model, which we've already given you uh, with SSCIM. And then you can take the trust but verify model if you'd like. This is subtractive. You can basically say, I have no risk. Okay, and I'm going to take away from that perfection every single time that I uh, that I find something wrong. So that's a subtractive model. There's also the build up scale, which is an additive model. It's basically I have all the risk, and I'm going to uh, build my way up to to good. You know what I mean? Um, this base bases your confidence based upon the quality of the intelligence that you've got. And for that purpose, we use uh, this model that's really hard to see, um, sorry, uh, which is the intelligence scale, right? So almost no chance, very unlikely, unlikely, roughly even chance, likely, very likely, or almost certainly, okay, as a probability. Um, you know, we, we kind of used another one that we created ourselves. Uh, it's a steaming pile or suboptimal, it's meh, meh, you know, good enough, bulletproof, right? Um, you can also weigh out the CIA, right? Right. So you can say, what's the weight of confidentiality, integrity, availability for a given system or service? What are you worried about? Uh, and then like for an example, buying a cloud service that'll house medical information, right? Or buying an industrial control system to, or DCS uh, to manage a power plant. Context is the key to the answer though. So as you're making that weight, you, you start thinking about what's your reputation uh, what's your financial exposure? What's your operational exposure? What's your safety exposure? Uh, because remember, the worst one is a loss of life, right? Don't ever forget that one. Um, and ultimately, that's those are some things that you can do. Now, we have a question for you. Is this useful? Are we nuts? Part of the Do question. We all need a vacation. <laughs> That's a separate hey, question. This is what we did for this is what we did for fun. <laughs> oh, I, I'm sorry. I, I I didn't get the memo. <laughs> so is this something that you could use? Is it a way to think about this or is it is it a reasonable way to think about this? This is what should we be changing? What should we be thinking about differently? based upon well, your feedback honestly uh spencer um the the way you uh propose things and it, i mean especially here in new mexico i i will say i see it tend to think uh, locally and i hate this phrase think globally i i really hate that but still it's worth thinking about because um i i myself work for the government so we have to think of 
how is the contract, you know, all the little details, but then what is this going to do for the greater good? Is it satisfying this, that, and that, or is it only doing one thing? Is there something better or can we do something better? Um, or, you know, do it a, a different way. Like you're know, looking at the supply chain and I mean, we are under restrictions being with the federal government, but still, is there, is there a better way to do it? You know, is there, you know, we, we always have, are asked to do more with less as everybody is. And, and we are the stewards of the taxpayer dollars. So that's always resonated in every meeting we have. Uh, so I really think it's worth uh, contemplating and bringing up about, you know, what are the options and, you know, how, how to look at it. Maybe we're, maybe we're missing something. Something is somebody hasn't brought up before because quote this is the way we've always done it. So I, I think you've brought up some very great points this evening. Well, thank you. I appreciate well, one thing that, I see, Spencer. Uh, that I've always had struggle with in terms of uh, the cyber community. Um, when we do risk assessments, they typically end up being what you were talking about with the low, medium, and high, and that's subjective. Okay. Uh, in my wife's world, which is where you're real familiar with that, that's an insurance world and they're objective, okay? They actually yep. can quantify the dollars down to, to a, a very you know, granular uh, area. And, and, and I think one of the struggles cyber has is we're not able to do that. And, and when we're not able to do that, we're not able to communicate with uh, the decision makers on the investments in security, as well as the, the, the real risk that might be present. And we're not, um, we're not the experts in that objective area and we're not meant to be, but I think that's where enterprise risk management enters the picture and, and we need to partner better. I, I to Ron, to add to that though, I think one of the challenges, the, one of the common challenges security professionals tend to have is we think of, we, we forget that, you know, we talked about, you know, the financial operational and reputational risk, and that's how the business thinks of risk. We tend to think of risk, risk. We, I think we tend to have the challenge of thinking of risk and how it manifests itself. And then we, we go to 11, if you will, when we think about that and we try to convey that to our audience. And, and to some extent, we're almost speaking technically gobbledygook. You're absolutely right that we haven't come down to the numbers, right? And that's where the actuarial science is really, is really not there. It's not there in this space for us to actually give numbers, to give value to loss. However, and, and there are some models that could get you there. But I also think part of the challenge, too, is the, the, the nature of the communicator. And it's not to say that any of us here are, are good, bad, or, or bad about it. I think that part of the challenge is, is we go a level deeper and we try to convey that to that, to that board level audience. And they're, they're like, you're, you're, you're speaking, you could be speaking in tongues to them. And, and I think that, again, coming back to the reputational and operational and financial aspects of risk helps to make them make the, make the leap easier. And it's almost like you kind of have to level up and kind of give more of a 10,000 foot view of those as opposed to where we tend to, where we would tend to operate. You know, I think I think that's a great point, Jason and and Ron. You're you're absolutely right. So, um, for for those of you who don't know, Becky, uh, Ron's wife, wonderful human being, uh, is is a risk manager as an ARM risk manager, right? Um, and you know, from that perspective, I, I actually um, I, I'm trying to eventually take those courses and and do them myself uh, through the insurance institutes because she's able to go okay, so uh, this is roughly where we are. Here's what that means in terms of dollars and cents. And that's what this does as far as the insurance that's going to cover all of these things, right? So we can transfer that risk to a third party. But the reality is even some of that risk transference is not going to protect you against the reputational loss, you know, and the reputation loss is another thing that we have to worry about. And that means good, effective work with our communications groups, uh, because they've got they, they have models too, right? Uh, and they're a much more exact science nowadays is marketing, right? Um, and then there's also the operational loss. And so we need to be talking to our engineers. Hey, what does this do if, if you're out of business for a week, if you can't uh, produce your widget, you know? And I, I can 
guaranteed they can tell you exactly what that means in terms of revenue. We can't. So partner, you know, partnerships are the most important part of this whole business. And and I, I really appreciate that comment, Ron, because you're spot on. We do have a tendency to be myopic and we think about our little, you know, part of the world. The truth is, you know, we're dependent upon the rest of the business, just like they're dependent on us. And, and Spencer, I'd, I'd like to in, inject just a little bit here. Um, Please. I, I spent some time here in Albuquerque with a small business association helping local small medical businesses with HIPAA, you know, with their risk assessment and just become compliant. And there's like two dentists, uh, front desk help, and that's it. And their server is underneath the sink in the break room. Okay. That's what we were running up against. And, you know, it's like, oh my God. Okay. You know, but the mission was good. I totally believed in the mission. I'm like, please God help these people. They're, they're doing the good for what they're doing. But at the same time, like you were saying, they didn't understand the risk. They didn't understand that they're up against, but HIPAA is still on their doorstep. OCR is still on their doorstep. Um, HHS is still on their doorstep. Everybody else is going to come after them if heaven forbid, whatever the worst happens and, and they get breached or whatever, but they weren't prepared for that. And so, you know, if, 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 if they don't know, how can you defend? You can't defend what that's, you don't know. That's exactly right. And, and it's, and, you know, it's yeah. up to us to evangelize this stuff, Tatra. And, and that's your, your spot on. That's why Jason and I want to do this, you know, giving this presentation is not just fun and it, great way for us to hang out and drink some beer and whatnot. Um, but it's, it's a good way for us to have the conversation about, well, how do we, how do we get people to understand it? Something that's really complicated, you know, um, when you start talking about supply chain, like I said, those interdependencies, it makes it impossible to get some, you know, to, to really get somebody to, to say, oh yeah, so we can do something about it. Otherwise, they're going to go, eh, that's what we're going to do about it. There's nothing we can do, so just accept it. So I have to, I have to say it is a exactly. massive network of things that are so interconnected. Um, I work as a consultant, and I deal with new companies every day and such. And the cybersecurity, the insurance part is a very frustration part to me because I, I talked to business owners who were like, well, it's okay, we have insurance. Well, it's sort of like, just because you have health insurance, you don't, that doesn't mean you leave the bottle of mayonnaise in your hot car. It will only cover certain amounts of things. I'm glad that got to you, Spencer. Uh, like it that. will only cover certain amounts of things, but the full scope of it. And when you're dealing with insurance, you, you can't cross the betterment line. When I go in and I'm dealing with a ransomware, I can only get them back to where they were. I can't really make suggestions and improvements into their network because insurance doesn't want to pay for that. So all of my time spent up to that point learning what it is, I can't cross that betterment line and offer suggestions and help. So it is a very complex issue. Um, about two months ago, I was dealing with a small 25 person company that was making a part for carburetors for a major American car manufacturer. They got ransomware. They got locked out of everything. The ripple effect means that if you go down to the local, not going to say their name, store and try and buy a truck, there's a back order because of this ripple effect from a very small company that was affected by ransomware and such. So it is finding those little, the way the network fits together and finding those little pieces is, is very difficult. No, I agree with that, Matthew. Thanks for, for that comment. And again, and I, I just wrote down, uh, just because you have medical insurance doesn't mean you should eat mayonnaise you store in your hot car. So I'm going to use that um, and I'll attribute it. Uh, so, but for whatever it's worth, you know, one of the key opportunities here is to, to think about how we improve, you know, and, and it starts with understanding, um, you know, Sun Tzu said, know your adversary and know yourself, right? Uh, and, and that's, that's the first step. Well, do you, do you know yourself? Do you know your own organization? Do you know where your data is? Do you know what data you have? Do you know where your industrial controls are? 
Um, do you have all of those mapped out and you understand their vulnerabilities and you understand uh, perfectly uh, what mitigations and mitigating controls you have in place? If you don't, stop there. Like, go and do that first, right? And then after you do that, well, then let's invest in some threat intelligence. You know, who, who, what, when, where, how, why, let's know everything we can about our adversaries. You know, once you've got that, then you can begin some of these processes. But the rea the reality is, if you go into any company, any business, any organization in this country, and you go and look at those contracts that exist between you and others, you're going to find that's where your real vulnerabilities are. And it has nothing to do with your technology. It has to do it's with it. It's interesting that you say that, uh, Spencer, because... You know, I was told a while back that I should go read uh, this book, and I really went, I took it to heart, and I went and read it, okay? It's The Art of War by Sun Tzu, which is an old Chinese document that describes how to go to war and what you need to do. And those fundamental things, they have not changed. Um, That's right. Whether you're in cyber war or kinetic war or whatever it is, um, the, the the know thyself and know thy enemies and, and all that good stuff. It's really what we're in. Uh, it's, th it's the same thing, although we may put different uh, three letter acronyms to it or whatever, it's still the same stuff. It absolutely is, Ron. It, you're, you're spot on. And, you know, so for whatever it's worth, read The Art of War and then think about it. It's not one of those things you're going to digest and just you know, this glow will come about you as a result of having read it. You got to think about it for, you know, sometimes years before it finally becomes clear um, when you have that moment, you know what I mean? Um, but for whatever it's worth, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that somebody's uh, somebody other than me is reading that. So, so I, I got to raise my hand. I've, I, I've read it. <laughs> Great. All right. It was required so, reading by my father-in-law. So <laughs> you read, you read the Art of War. You read Machiavelli's The Prince, and then you go Hobbes, Locke. I mean, for those of us who had way too much social science education, <laughs> sorry, yeah. um, I, yeah. then you, you know, yeah. then you, then you could go down the whole. Yeah, I. That's that's not. It's it's bad. It's bad. I'm not gonna yeah, stop just, right there. Yeah, you yeah, put yeah. me in that group. I I spent too way well, much time in the Midwest. I had. I had a lot of time on my hands. <laughs> so so the, the, I think the, the challenge, and you probably are speaking to it with your last comment, is that we can't be academic about it only. Um, unfortunately, we have to be uh, proactive and we have to be doing things and, and not just reading the art of war. Okay? <laughs> so That's I, right. I, I get that. <laughs> You're absolutely well, the right. The art of war teaches how to stay in peace. The whole premise of the art of war is not to go to war. Yeah, oh. that's right. That is it's, an it's, excellent point. That's a good point. And uh, sometimes you don't have a choice, right? And that's that's the other point of it. It's and when you don't have the choice, be really, really smart about it. You know, and and I think that's been our problem. We walked right in, uh, set ourselves up for failure out of the gate. Um, every network in the world is set up for failure out of the gate um, just because we use TCP IP, you know, uh, this, this entire, the, the, the entire construct of networking that we have was designed for an open communications mechanism. And now we've been trying to, to push the poop back in the horse for years. Right. <laughs> so, so that's, that's our challenge, right? So how do we get past that? Well, the reality is, when you start to look at this risk and you start to understand the full scope of it, you start to begin to realize the really important piece, which is, hey, we're barely scratching the surface when we're talking about networks. Our real risk is all the people we're dependent on being the ones who get breached. Everybody in this room is really interested in cyber. They're really interested in security. They're really good at it. You guys have, you know, Hundred, there's probably 150 years of experience just here in this call, right? So I want you guys to think about that. We know what we're doing. How about that that uh, lawyer's office that was part of the brokerage of the product that you bought from Taiwan 
that sourced some of its parts from Vietnam, that sourced some of its parts from China. You know what I mean? Because they're they're the weak link. Are you ready for that? And that's that's where the real risk is. And we don't have any way to deal with that yet. So I'm hoping that this tool set um, that Jason and I came up with, uh, I, I'm hoping that it's useful. And if it's not, let us know how we can make it more useful. So, Tatra, thank you for having us. Oh, well, thank you so much. I, I too was trying to find my microphone button, I guess still. After two years, we're, we're still not figuring that one out. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> here, let me put the video back on, it's only fair. Uh, but thank you so much. I mean, seriously, I, you brought great points up. And even for the federal government, there are things we need to look at. We do have processes that we have to go through by law. Um, I myself being part of the Department of the Interior, we also have additional restrictions. Well, I, I should call them restrictions. Um, additional things we have to, to look at because of the Indian uh, nature that we're dealing with the, and, the, and those uh, governments. And, and to, to think through all that and to calculate the risk, we always have, we have to do a, what's called an ATO, authorization to operate, mm -hmm. if we bring on a system new online. And now it has to be in the cloud. So we either have to pick a cloud solution or we have to pick a fed ramped one already. And so even what we are saying, it's still fed right into what we're dealing with in the federal government because it still has to fall in line with what the feds are telling us we have to do. Plus we have um, the, the indigenous people uh, regulations that we're having to deal with and other data calls and everything else we have to do. But still, all this is still relevant because where does that come from? We have to vet who are the vendors. It has to go through like three other departments before it can even come back to me as far as vetting and, and, and who they are. So this is, is valid even for the, the federal government folks, contractor or fed. Um, th this is pertinent to, through the whole way. Um, when the issue came out about the flaw, about the, um, the pieces of the, um, a lot of the, the video monitoring uh, cameras oh, that we yeah. have yep. in, in a lot of our facilities, uh, those were generated out of Asian countries that are, are of concern, let's just put it that way. Um, so we had to whole, we had to go through, we had to assess everything, we had to revamp everything, we had to look at the vendors, we had to look at everything again. And so this isn't just a, you know, something for the general community, we in the government, even with the regulations we already have, there can be another thing coming out and they're like, whoa, everybody has to look at their hardware now. Oh, great. <laughs> we're nationwide let's go you know uh, uh, right. yay. one more thing i mean we have to do it I, you know it's not that we're not going to but it's like oh great one more ch check a box of one more thing we have to do along with everything else we have to do um that's right but it, it, it's still very valid i mean we, we we can't have unknown uh possible security risks in hardware that are sitting in our facilities can't, we, we can't have that. That's overriding everything else we're putting in place. Thousands, hundreds of dollars, depending on what system we're talking about. Um, so it's, it's, it's still very valid to, to look down that chain, to make sure they're vetted, to make sure they're with the FedRAMP group, if that's appropriate, to make sure that they're at least, um, in our case, we have to check that they are um, either American Indian owned or minority owned. Um, there's so many other things we have to check through. Um, just not security, but also contractual wise, but it, but it's all, part, you know, it's, um, it's all part of the process so that at the end, when we do award the contract and we can move forward, that then helps us move to a smooth rollout because we are less experiencing some major horrific, sometimes um, things we didn't see coming, um, may, a, a setting that we didn't know wasn't set or a major setback, uh, you know, that helps really stop that from the beginning by going through all these processes. That's right. Well, you know, uh, my, my personal favorite is um, NERC, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, uh, made the decision 
uh, to buy a cloud service product uh, to manage and effectively administer all of our compliance you know so all of our audit materials all of our evidence everything <laughs> and they bought this cloud service that that they decided that they were going to implement and after they signed the contract the very large contract uh, it was bought by a chinese corporation oh, I'm, I'm sorry i'm not trying to oh my oh my goodness so so you can imagine we don't give them the information that they want right uh, nobody I, does I'm, I'm i'm sure <laughs> and so to fire a shot they're just gonna buy us that's, oh. that's probably very true so oh. at any rate well I, w I wanted to thank you guys for inviting us and you know the opportunity and I, and jason thank you very much for for jumping on and um for doing this i know it's like you know oh dark 30 there so yeah, well, I was, you know, it was, uh, thank little you to all you East Coasters, figure. seriously, I appreciate it. Spur of the moment. I'm just, what else was I doing today? <laughs> I don't know. It looks like you got some workout equipment in the background there. You, you, well, know. you know, there's, 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 a, there's some, not that I'm leaping on it right now. Um, <laughs> the, the air bike, the air bikes, yeah, the air bikes at the ready, but there's <laughs> other things that get used too. So. Oh, I, I totally see that. I, I'd be watching TV too. <laughs> <laughs> so well thank you all very much and and it's it's great to see everybody and if there's ever anything at all that you need uh i'm a member and i'm right down the street so i look forward to working thank with you, you in so the future much. and thank you everybody for attending really appreciate it and, and thank you spencer i mean oh my gosh listening to his schedule i, I don't even know he had time to even fit us in and i i really do appreciate that especially this time of the year i only a couple of days ago did I realize Thanksgiving was next week and I'm personally freaking out. Um, so <laughs> for Spencer to find time for us, uh, thank you so much. <laughs> thank it's you. that time of year. Uh, but um, it was great presentation, fantastic material. Could have asked for more. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Have, 